I am really looking forward to this discussion. I'm Janae Sharp. I'm the founder of the Sharp Index, and I am here today with experts in electronic health records and medicine and, and in mental health. So one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to this discussion today is we're going to talk about the intersection and connections between um, physician burnout, electronic health record usability, moral injury, and, and progress. And we brought together some experts. This conversation is a little bit of a continuation of some of the questions that we had during Health Impact East in New York, where there was a lot of questions of who's responsible. So I invited back Josh Holtzbauer from the Epic Physician Burnout Team, Dr. Wendy Dean, um, who is one of our award winners and also an expert in moral injury and Dr. Okay, I don't even say know how to say your last name. I only call you Dr. Matt. So uh, this is why I normally have everybody introduce themselves. Um, um, who's an, a virtualist and an expert in clinical informatics as well. Do you want to introduce yourselves and kind of let us know, kind of level set for us here? Um, Josh, could you start? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Janae. Excited to be on the panel today. I'm Josh Holzbauer on the EPIC Physician Wellbeing Team. And um, my background uh, was implementation at Epic for about 10 years before um, around 2014, moved over to the physician support time support team full time. Um, so and I wear a lot of hats here, but um, I'm sure uh, we'll have some lively discussion about, about those things a little bit later on, but great to be here. I'm glad you could make it. Matt, go. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Matt Sakamoto, uh, virtualist primary care physician based out of San Francisco, uh, also a fellowship trained in clinical informatics at UCSF. So I kind of nerd out on the back end side of stuff as well as uh, practicing uh, primary care physician as well. So get to experience it and kind of hear about it from my colleagues uh, in terms of the EHR documentation burden uh, in basket and everything in between. Perfect. And Wendy? I'm Wendy Dean. I am a psychiatrist by training, but about five years ago, I went, I moved full time to addressing clinician distress and actually distress in other workforces as well, not just healthcare. And the CEO and um, co founder of Moral Injury of Healthcare. Perfect. One of the things I like about all three of you is that you're listeners, like you pay attention to, to what's going on. So I'd, I'm looking forward to hearing your, your unique perspectives and and what you think we should do next. So Matt, you're first. What is the connection between usability and clinician burnout? Yeah, I think for me, it's a lot, of, it's, it's just hard to use. Actually, so as, as a bit of my background, I actually trained on paper, youngish, but at the hospital I, I trained at during my residency was on paper. And the level of friction between what I have in my mind, what I need to do for the patient, and then getting that into an order or a note was relatively low because we all know how to write or type. Um, so I think it's that usability piece, like how do we maintain kind of the safety measures that EHRs do bring. My handwriting is horrible, um, but like also get, go basically from brain to order to patient um, with less friction. So I think for me, it's kind of like, how do we know what to do and then facilitate what the end user needs to do? It'd be one big step towards making that happen. Josh, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, with regard to Matt's comment, I, I definitely agree with his perspective there. I think that when we made the transition as a country to move toward electronic health records, uh, you know, from our point of view, we definitely wanted to to keep that friction low and really keep it as easy on the physicians in terms of documentation burden as we could. But we did find um, that uh, along with moving things from paper to to being electronic, that a lot of things came with that. That the physicians probably didn't want to see. Um, and some of it was really well intentioned. There are some, there are definitely patient safety benefits, especially with regard to the legibility. Um, that's probably the first thing that stands out uh, to Matt's point. And then also, you know, ordering support, looking for um, interaction alerts, medications and allergies and things like that. But we also saw a lot of regulatory burden get introduced uh, with those changes. So that uh, in, in addition to that, um, certainly financial uh, demands from the health systems and, and from some of the groups that uh, in the country that oversee uh, the organizations that, um, that offer Epic to their physicians. So um, yeah, with just 
making the the transition to being electronic, a lot of extra things, uh, extra demands uh, from outside parties came along with that. Uh, and not to say that we can't do better with usability, because of course we can. We can always do better, and we're working on it. But yeah, certainly there's um, other groups that were very interested in that information, uh, and still are very interested, and continue to request and sometimes demand more information be uh, asked of the physicians. Unfortunately. All right. We could. We we'll, we might want to delve into that more more later. I'd love to hear Wendy, like your perspective. Um, I think it's a little bit different. Uh, actually, it's not. I mean, I I, I think. I think um, the HRs were put in place with all good intent from, from all parties. The problem is, I think, that the paper charts really had one purpose, which was patient care. And everybody else who needed that data scraped those paper charts for the data that they needed. But when the EHR came into being, there were so many other entities that thought, <gasps> this could solve our problems. And they all wanted a piece of it. And so they all put their own wish list into it, forgetting the burden that would come along with that for those who were inputting the data, which happens to be the clinicians primarily. So I think it was done with all good intent, but I think we're, we, in trying to do so much with it, we really just, we lost sight of what it would be like to use it. And now we're fighting against that. Yeah. One of the interesting things that we've discussed, like in some of my groups, um, I'm also involved with Utah Hymns, and they talked about that history of developing the charts and how the number one concern then for most of your hospital admin and informatics team is billing. And that concern remains number one. So this was a few years ago um, when we were really trying to push solutions for physician burnout, kind of like before it was super popular, um, out here saying, you know, this is going to be the next thing. This is something we should talk to. And, and they're like, you, and just looking at the sheer data about um, the amount of people who still identify um, reimbursement as their number one concern is staggering. So I'd love to kind of hear what all of you think about that. And um, like, are there opportunities like to address that and um, and to leverage health IT to help burnout? Or is it still that we, we should be working on fixing reimbursement? Who wants to start? I'll take first crack at that one. It's a, you're alluding to, I think, like the idea of like incentives and like we're all humans, we respond to incentives. I think in the larger sense, like that's kind of when you're more fee-for-service based, you try to do more, you try to document what you did and you get paid for what you do, not for outcomes that you get. I think, but it's the nickel and diming for like, it's like every little thing you do. I think I just got an email about like, make sure that you document uh, when you rinse out your patient's ears because there's a separate code for that. So I think people want to get paid for what they do, but we've like nickeled and dimed it to the point of every little thing needs to get documented to then get reimbursed for. So I think probably, I mean, we'll jump into this a little bit as well with like my current practice, I mostly take uh, HMO capitated payment patients. So I'm not bean counting myself while I'm seeing the patients. It's kind of like, what do I do to provide care for the patients that month, that year um, that are on my panel? And that mindset has switched has been different, but I really recognize that the fee for service setup is the majority of what most um, clinicians and physicians are working in, at least in the US. And there's definitely a lot of clinic clinicians out there who are sort of straddling both worlds. So some of their patients are at least under certain circumstances, it, they're seeing someone on a fee-for-service basis. But in other cases, uh, it's more like uh, what Matt experiences where it's a capitated model and it's some agreement uh, where you're going to get reimbursed based on the outcomes. And it's not always 100% clear uh, when you're when the patient walks in the room, exactly what the situation is. So having to live in both those worlds, which are very different uh, in terms of how you practice, the questions you ask, um, and the, what's required of you during the course of that visit and afterward, it's hard to, to be in both those places at once. I mean, I guess the question I would ask is, how did we do this before the EHR? Clinicians um, didn't have 
didn't have necessarily the same level of responsibility for the billing end. And should we be looking at that as a question? How are the billing offices, you know, can we ask billing offices to, to um, find ways to better support the clinicians and take on that responsibility without saying, without continuing to push down onto them, you need to document this, you need to document that, which then bloats the note, which makes it difficult to use, which makes it difficult to find information in um, and makes it less usable as a clinical document. Um, I had a few thoughts from what all of you are saying. One is, um, should the practice of medicine be different? It seems like the first thing that we talked about just now is how the model of reimbursement impacts you in a positive way and that you don't have to like nickel and dime patients to death, but also that, that that's different. Like, okay, that sounds pretty, <laughs> that's not great for patients, right? Like if, if I, like, do I get to know, do I get to identify like, okay, you're going to go to the one that, that like, you know, does that make sense? That sentiment? Patients can, if they're in a, if they're in an insurance, if they can choose an insurance model that has value-based care. So probably very few patients then. I think today, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably under 20%. Um, and, and that's just off the cuff, but I would imagine it's, it's under 20% in terms of patients that are, that are being seen with value-based care. But I don't want to focus just too much on, you know, the reimbursement. Although there's there's plenty to talk about there, there really is. Um, but yeah, certainly there, there's other challenges that are that are exacerbating the crisis. I mean, one of them is just there are not enough physicians, uh, particularly in primary care. So we've seen over the course of the last ten or fifteen years, a, a lot more medical students are opting into going into specialties and subspecialties where um, you know they can certainly. Um, make more money in those specialties than in primary care. So um, there's that initial problem where there aren't enough physicians. Also, we're dealing with a sicker population. We have an aging population um, that these people need to take care of. Uh, and so just those that sort of demographic information uh, has put a lot of burden on those physicians in the healthcare system. And then in addition to that, I mean, COVID um, was and is a major major uh, event for everyone in healthcare, including the patients out there. And so folks are still recovering from that um, and trying to, we're hearing from health systems today that, you know, the margins are getting thinner and thinner uh, as this emergency continues to, con excuse me, continues on over time. So I don't, I don't, it's, and you have with that, with COVID, you have a lot more patients getting virtual, getting online and, and demanding care. And I say that in a good way, demanding care online, because that's what they need in their lives. So a lot of health systems out there are stretching um, and trying to meet the, the needs of people who, need, who demand to be seen virtually. They want their questions answered virtually. And yet there's only so many physicians with so much time trying to meet all that demand. Right. I think that's very true. Like um, without like a nod to the shortages in staffing and physicians, like the conversation's hard. Um, both of you brought up, um, you know, what health IT, like what, you know, either an accounting department or what your technology, what can it do to help? Like, what's the solution? And Wendy, you brought up something that I thought was fascinating. Like, are there, are there solutions? And I, I'd love to know, like, have any of you seen those that are working? that are fantastic and don't cost a ton of money. <laughs> that last part is, yeah, the important. I mean, I think just from my broad perspective, having worked with a lot of the groups in the country and a few groups internationally, something that does work, but does take investment of people uh, in time is team-based care, moving towards a model where uh, the physician isn't the only person that interacts with the patient. You have a number of people and that could be nurses, care coordinators, medical assistants, they're each operating to the type of top of their licensure. And the physician only does things that need a physician's licensing to do. Um, if it's just, you know, putting in 
historical information uh, or just check, checking boxes that are required for, you know, who knows what reason exactly. We've seen huge movement on that when groups have moved in that direction. We're, and we're talking about saved money. We're talking about much better, or excuse me, much lower burnout numbers for the physicians. We know it works. Uh, we have the tools to support it. But it's it can be daunting to say, how are we going to do this across uh, a group of, let's say we got 1500 physicians, you can't just, you know, flip, can't just flip a switch and, oh, we're doing team-based care. Uh, you, you really need to trick, change the way that you practice medicine in a way. Um, but we, we know the investment is recouped uh, when you, when you do put the time in to do that, but it can be daunting for the, for the bigger organizations out there. That's just one example. I'll let Wendy and Matt add some others. I, I think if we, Rather than just talking all of a sudden about how are we going to shift the entire practice of medicine, I think there are probably ways that we can start to intervene in what goes into the EHR in the first place. So, you know, changing, we know that changing the culture can take a generation. I don't think the clinicians who are practicing now have a generation to wait. They are, they are getting, they're exhausted. They need, they need help now. And one of the things that I would really love for health systems and EHRs to think about is where are the places that we can cut down on the data that we need to put in? When you look at what happened in COVID, there were so many regulations and so many requirements that got turned off. And really, we were still able to take care of patients. What of those things can we continue forward? How do we negotiate with some of the agencies like CMS and the CDC and the FDA who all want a piece of the EHR and want a piece of that data? How do we negotiate with them to minimize their requirements and or to harmonize them so that the inputs are less? How do we do the same thing with state agencies who have requirements? And I'm actually interested, um, sort of along Wendy's idea, is that like I didn't know what a product manager was until I started doing some work uh, with startups. So like I kind of all my time was with um, either health <laughs> systems or large academic health centers. Uh, I've worked with a, mostly a lot of virtual care and telehealth startups. And this idea of a product manager, not project, but product manager, has to take into account financial realities, um, prioritize what the goals are, what kind of data they need, and like what the end user experience is like. And then, so I'm actually curious, like why health systems don't have product managers? It, they're supposed to balance these priorities that we're talking about here, external um, reporting priorities, financial priorities, which everyone uh, kind of needs to have in mind and end user priorities. So I guess for those that have worked as vendors, like I'm sure Epic has product managers. And then for those that have worked in large health systems, like why doesn't that type of role exist in the corporate medicine half of things? And in, and in other places, they call them program managers. If there's not actually a product, there's a program manager, which which takes into account all those as well. But I haven't seen that, right? Like maybe the CMIO kind of does that, but usually not. They're at a too high of a level to manage each of those things. Like, is there, I haven't really seen equivalent program. Isn't it like managers. the head of your business line, essentially, your business line product managers. Like I knew people who've done that. I certainly know a lot of insurance plan product managers. But to Wendy's point, I think like there's each person wants a piece of this and then the uh, CIO or whoever's regulatory says, yeah, I guess government says we got to do it. So add that on to the um, you know, tech list that um, the vendor has to add or that we will educate our uh, clinicians to click that box to make sure that we check that regulatory box. But there's no one that's able to say like, oh, hold on. like. So we we yeah. actually we actually have had interactions with organizations who have pushed back and been mm -hmm. successful. And, and they've gone to their either their state agency or their local agency and said, mm, hang on, you have, we're giving you this data in three other places. So mm -hmm. either we can reformulate it and you'll take away some of those other three things that we're giving you, or you'll be happy with those three things that we're already giving you. And you can find a way on the back end to scrape the data that you need, but we're not going to add one more thing. Where we and it's and it's that sense of um, breaking down barriers, not explaining why they're there, mm -hmm. that I really think we need to shift our mindset to that and and start start asking as leaders in an organization, do I need to do this? 
Can I push back? How do I push back? And how do I do it in a collaborative way? And I, I think there are examples of that. I mean, at least within the community of organizations that use Epic. One example that I like to give is Hawaii Pacific. Uh, lovely climate there. Um, you know, they did have a team of people that went to work and they were mostly clinicians and folks who are in clinical informatics. And what they worked on is getting rid of stupid stuff. Um, and this is over the years, we, we kind of alluded to this earlier, you know, one at a time, these requests come in and it always sounds innocuous, like, oh, this is a good idea for us to collect this data. You know, it might be good down the road for financial reasons or reporting. We hear that a lot. Uh, and so it's just one more thing for the clinicians to do. And so they don't, you know, they don't feel that bad about putting it in. But of course, over the course of five years, 10 years, 15 years, this becomes a mountain of things. And some of those um, inputs that they requested, the programs that had the idea to add them, they might not even exist. They might not be active anymore. The people who led those programs might be not even be with the organization anymore. So what they did uh, was they just, they, um, if you follow lean methodology, they went to the Gemba where the, the value is created. They talked to the clinicians and, and just asked them directly, what is in here that is just of no value to you that you, you find yourself entering? Uh, and just by this method, just asking the clinicians, mostly nurses on the hospital side, they were able to get a great list of here are a number of things we can just remove and make people's lives easier. Uh, they did that. They published and we've had a no number of other groups uh, do their own version of getting rid of stupid stuff, or the acronym is GROSS. Um, and so that's been a big achievement, very empowering for the clinicians uh, who can just tell uh, the folks who come in, we don't like we enter this and we don't even know why. It just takes our time. Uh, and so creating those types of partnerships absolutely helps. And what everyone wants to do with tech, it seems like, is add things, add more technology, add more complexity. Um, and in, that's for, at least for Hawaii including Pacific and the other buying groups. Gifts. That What's that? <laughs> including all the people buying gifts that well, I know. That's true. All the men on but, my wish list, sorry. They're like, let's buy this one. I'm like, okay, well, you know. But I mean, I think for <laughs> groups doing that, it's it's addition by subtraction. And that's what we try to do on the physician well-being team is find things that are in the system that are just completely superfluous and just take them away, especially when we have studies that show uh, that inform like uh, messages that come in for clinicians that are not sent by another clinician. It's just sort of an automated message from the EHR. We know those are more tied to burnout than the ones from the human beings, which makes sense, right? So we do have a, a playbook that we walk organizations through and say, this is stuff that you can slowly get rid of and just you won't lose anything. You only, you'll gain efficiency and you'll gain uh, confidence back from the clinicians who use the system. So I think it's it's also a, a sort of a, a shifting of mindset from nice to have to must have. And I was talking to someone else who was referencing that same sort of activity, the gross activity, um, who was saying when they looked at it, they got 300 separate things that people said was useless or didn't add value. And only 15% of those were requirements. The other 85% was either an overinterpretation of a requirement, an overinterpretation of a rule, or a local policy that could just get turned off. And I think if, if we could imagine just getting rid of automatically just wiping out 85% of those things that don't seem to add value for clinicians, imagine the decrease in abrasion that they would experience. I mean, it's remarkable. It, it, but it goes back to Wendy's theme of like, rather than shifting the work, right? Like, how do we actually just get rid of it entirely? Um, and I think from that one, and just asking why, I think those are the two things that I kind of, one, I ask why way too much of my organization, but I, I ask why a lot for exactly those reasons, right? Like, let's think about why, why this is here. The other one is courage to say no, right? It's like, either back to uh, regulatory agents that are asking for information and or let's be honest, like there are small programs within an institution that may ask for something and be like, you know what, like, I can see how that might be helpful, but like that's going to just add a lot of extra noise to everyone else in the organization. So you might bring in the big bucks at your division, but like across the system, we're going to have to say no. So I think like courage to say no is also not there a lot of the times. And then it ends up you have to like get rid of the stupid stuff down the line uh, rather than just saying no up front. Another example I wanted to provide 
was Northwestern uh, in the Chicago area came up with a great formula. They called it the Physician Administrative Burden, the PAB, and uh, it's got some real math behind it. I'm not a great at math, but it was impressive to me. I, and basically, what? But you did just sell math quite well with the power of mathematics. <laughs> I tell my kids every day math is important, every single day. Um, but what they were able to do is basically say. If you are going to require something of our physicians, you need to show that you can take it away somewhere else. So if you're going to, I mean, the example for them was asking the attendings to enter the yeah, expected date of delivery within, I can't remember, sorry, I don't remember how many hours after the initial admission. But so the answer to that from Northwestern is maybe, but you need to show us a provide, show us the value that of a, of a physician doing that versus someone else doing that. And then also, if you're going to require it, then you have to take something away somewhere else to make it click neutral. And ultimately, they ended up having uh, someone else fill out that fill out that information. And so they've got a good formula there, and I'm happy to share that offline. But yeah, that's another group that's sort of found the right balance, I would say. I like that. I also think it's important when we're talking about some of this balancing act of burned out physicians, what is it, at least 75% still represent that like their EMR is a source of it's not you know it doesn't bring them joy you know mm -hmm. something they would throw out the window if they could um so like it sounds like there there are some programs we have a toolkit too of like how to get involved like how to be um how to be better are a lot of these solutions going to be just something simple like that like do we just need to bring the lean guys over to hhs and like cms and be like hey guys don't even know this but like what you're telling us to do is like not that cool or is it something else you know so i think i mean i think we can't underestimate the power of co-producing some of those solutions oh, i like that i worked in government I, I worked in government i worked for the department of defense for almost a decade and wow. it was really important to us to work with the people who were in our programs to make sure that they were successful so if as a if as a cohort or as a group large hospital systems can go to the federal government and say look this is this is we need to talk <laughs> we need to talk about what you're asking us to do can we negotiate what what requirements you have and there are actually there are actually um, efforts underway in the government to harmonize and to reduce requirements. So can we help them do that better faster and reduce the burden on clinicians? I like that because a lot of what I've done too is like connect them, you know, connect the people who are involved at the hospital level to the government level. Like co-producing is really important. Right. What's staggering out there right now is if you just look at primary care, the requirements, the, the regulatory requirements, the, the quality requirements uh, are, in the, the study came out last year that showed if, if a primary care physician followed each of those requirements to the T, then it would take about, I believe it was 20 hours a day um, just to meet those requirements, um, which is <laughs> just not realistic, obviously. Um, so yeah, I, we do need, uh, I'm not saying there isn't a dialogue, but there needs to be a better, more productive dialogue between yeah, the healthcare systems. I think the vendors can play a role in this too, um, to state agencies, federal agencies, as, as Wendy said, to demonstrate this, what we have is not realistic. Um, and you're asking the physicians to sort of make these horrible choices uh, between what's required of them financially, uh, uh, what's required from a regulatory perspective, what's required for good patient care, they can't do all of it. Um, and so they're picking and choosing what they do. And that's part of what you know, the what makes them burned out or to Wendy's point, that's part of the moral injury of I signed up to do this to take care of people and to save lives. And I feel like I can't do all of these things at one time. Um, and so yeah, that's that's absolutely part of the challenge. I like yeah. that. Also, when we were looking at some of user behavior in the HR, they do kind of work 20 hours a day. Um, 
Yeah. And when you look at, when you take it one step bigger and you look at hospital systems, when you look at the number of regulations that a hospital system has to follow, it's in the many hundreds. It's like 700 something separate regulations that a community hospital has to meet. It's no wonder they're struggling. And that's just the external regulations, right? Even within an organization, you have each individual yeah, correct. as well, right? And then those, so those external regulations get turned into internal policies, often policies that are not designed by someone who is doing the Gemba and, and understands the workflow, right? So you're like, of course you have to just click this box or we have because we have to send this out. And it's like, well, one, do we have to send it out to your idea of co-producing? But then two, is there a better process? If, if, this, is, if this does have to get sent out for whatever reason, is there a better process for doing this rather than, again, having the... Um, clinician do all the clicking. Well, you are a primary care physician, right? So you can tell us now about your 20 hour work days. What have you done? Yeah, I do lots of clicking, but I also, so uh, to Josh's prior point, I get to work with team-based care. So I work with like a really good nurse practitioner, an awesome MA that, it, and it's true team-based care, not role-based care. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that piece um, a little bit. They have role-based care where you have multiple people, um, but it's a different MA each day. So they don't get to know my style and they don't get to know my patients. So I think that's the biggest difference is true team-based care, like a sports team, like I know the names of who I work with and they know the names of all of the patients on our panel. So I think that, so is there lots of clicks? Yes. Um, because it's an HMO-based one, I'm not counted towards how many RVUs I get and how many visits I do. It's just how do we provide the care? Um, make sure they get their cancer screenings, make sure that they get their diabetes and blood pressure screenings. We're all working together as a team to make sure that that, that happens. And one, it's way more fun as a clinician. Um, again, kind of feels like a sports team almost. Uh, but then two, uh, it filters up. So to the practicing at top of license and everything like that, things that need my level of medical school knowledge uh, filter up to me and things that are like, can you please fill out this prior auth form? comes to me mostly pre-filled, still, still needs my signature. Prior off is a whole nother thing, but like it, it's teed up for me. So the number of things that are pended and teed up um, for me to review and act on rather than to have to like cognitively think about, check the chart, pull things, call the insurance company and then put that in, all happens before it hits um, my inbox, which I think is definitely lowers my level of burnout compared to any other health system I've worked at. So I, w I like that, that they're, that they're lowering it. We every year have awards and about technology and, and a couple of years in a row, the ones that won were scribes, you know, essentially like an artificial intelligence scribe based tool. Um, they got acquired, then they won again. <laughs> we should have made a rule that you can't win when you get acquired and become a new company. Right. <laughs> um, this year, the winner was, um, they help surface the appropriate insights to the point of care that you're delivering. And I feel like a lot of our discussion has been like, you know, we're taking things away. There are a lot of stupid processes like can, that can be improved. Um, the things people that I've seen are really excited about are, you know, technology that gives us less work or gives us better data. Like what have you seen that like either helps with team-based care, um, yeah, stuff like that. I can take one piece. Sorry, I've done a lot of talk, but let me give this one. I think so. There's one, like, how do we just decrease the documentation requirements? But then two is like, particularly for the in-basket, how do we put something upstream that can screen some of these things, right? Get to the patient to the right level of care at the right time. So there's a lot of uh, like chat bot triage sort of things where it doesn't require human intervention, does require money to um, buy or license that technology, but you can screen a lot of things and or take a lot of the information extraction time um, on the patient's own time. So by the time that it gets to even the MA that's starting to do that next triage, you're maximizing um, kind of the impact of like human hu human time versus. So I, I think putting those kind of um, chatbots, when done right upstream, I think um, I've seen be very effective. And I've worked with a couple of different ones just um, kind of on, on my side as well. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you call in your bank and you're like, this is is not oh, going to work right. Yeah. So yeah, chat yes. box in as much as you can actually use your own words um, versus like a phone tree where please press one is like the worst thing ever. So I think true chat bots that can actually get patient information uh, without burning out the patient, right? We don't want to just shift all of that. Um, but I think putting some of that information extraction outside of the face-to-face -face clinical time really does help um, kind of the burnout and, and some of that patient education piece as well. But yeah, definitely no phone trees, no phone trees. So I mean, a well-designed well phone tree is great, let's be clear, but you I mean, know. What, 
what I would like to make sure is that any data that we're extracting from the patient is data that we need in the clinical encounter. Hmm. Because there's nothing that I've heard that fries patients more than spending time filling in boxes, filling in text boxes, filling, checking, you know, doing their own clicks. And then they get there and the clinician has not opened it, has not used it, does not refer to it, can't find it, can't find it. <laughs> That's you know, happened I, to me personally. Yeah, so yeah. me too. Everybody, everybody <laughs> with, too. It's happened with paper, you know, when you used to fill it yep. out in the waiting room and then yep. no and one, like they just kind of set it aside. They, st they still do yeah. that. They still do that. No here. one looks at it. And then it's happened electronically too, where I'll, I'll do I'll fill out some information ahead of the visit and it's never brought up or never asked. So I basically have to re uh, retell my story. Yeah. And, and so, I, I mean, I think, I think being really thoughtful and intentional of what we ask of whomever it is, who's putting data in, do we need it? Do we really, really need it? Or is it just a nice to have? Yeah. I, I really agree with that, Wendy, because it's, it catch it burns the candle at both ends because number one, it's enter it's extra information to be entered by some person and that might be the patient, the nurse, the physician, whomever. And then on the other side, it's more data to sift through later. So it's it's right. a double whammy uh, when you add these things in. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah, that actually reminds me of another Chicago-based uh, group, Jeff Panzer and maybe Chris Sinsky, I think they had a paper, basically it's that with FQHCs, and it goes back to regulations that are always asking patients PHQ-9 questions, depression screening questions, all of these things that they think are regulations or are interpreting as regulations, but often don't get looked at. And then the patients are kind of getting burned out in it, and then the clinicians are like, why are we... <laughs> checking these things. So to Josh's point, you really are kind of burning at both ends um, for maybe something that you didn't even need in the first place. Seems like a good idea, right? Let's let's screen for depression. I think that's very important. But when you do it for every patient over the age of 18 and every visit that you do, let's think about why we're asking this, right? Is it the spirit and of if, what we to get to? And if we don't have, if if they screen positive and we, what do we do then? Make sure that we have something in place to move them off to. I mean, this is one of the stories in my book screening for all these things. And the primary care physician is like, I can screen all day long. I have nowhere. I, I, my hands are tied. I can't do anything about it. So making sure that we also can follow through on those, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't know if somebody's depressed, if we don't have a place to send them, but, but also recognize that that is part of what's impinging on physicians or, or clinicians in general is if I know the answer and I can't do anything about it, how do I hold that? Help me do something with it. Yeah. Well, that's such a good point. I've, I've, I've seen that like recently where someone was like, do you have a place to go with this? I've seen that as a patient where I'm asked in the clinic, are you depressed? And the person asking it is saying it in, in, in such a way that I can tell they just want me to say no. They don't want to be, me to be honest. They just want me to say no, because if I say yes, then they got to deal with it. And they might, I mean, exactly Wendy, to your point, they might not have the right pathway um, in order to do that, especially not in the course of a 15 minute visit. Uh, so yeah, to, I've absolutely been asked before, you know, are you depressed? You know, basically assuming no. Um, and if, if that's how that's going to be asked, that's just, that's borderline offensive to me as a patient, just don't ask. Um, but the, they feel that they're required to ask. And so when there's a requirement without um, sort of a tie to, to the mission of the organization and, and next steps for those individual clinicians, that's what you end up with. Just people asking questions that they don't want the actual answer to. I do have a lot of thoughts. Like we're not going to go down the PQH9 route and mental health screening because yeah, um, I'd I know all of you are involved in initiatives to like improve this. Like Wendy, it was back, your book is coming. So I'd love to take the rest of the time for each of you to share, like what is on the horizon that you're most excited about that you're involved in? I can go first. So you had, just because Jenny, you had asked a little bit about the tech before. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about um, some tech, but just some things that we're excited about or that we've already done. Uh, so we've tried to introduce 
artificial intelligence into the system. We started with working on things like deterioration models on the inpatient side, risk of sepsis, uh, things like that. We have hundreds of groups that are live on those models, acuity scores, um, risk of readmission, the list goes on. But we've had pretty good success with that. We've also been trying to bring those efforts to the point of care as well. So introducing buttons in the system just based on how physicians use it. You know, you 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 almost always use this diagnosis with a patient like this, let's just suggest it as a button. So it's one click for you. Um, or these are your most common recipients for messages. Let's just automatically create uh, create a button for them. So we've worked on that too. I think also, you know, looking forward, we have a project uh, in the pilot phase right now to filter out messages uh, from either from patients or in this particular case, from people with your organization who are just saying like, thank you or thanks, um, or thank you very much. And I mean, there's hundreds of variables on that, but basically not like um, completely getting rid of those messages, but not notifying you of them. Because right now clinicians are just, they're distracted because their phones are chiming no and the computer wants their attention. <laughs> yeah, so that's something we're working on. <laughs> um, oh, and then job. we are- Not anymore. <laughs> I was I was kind of thinking that maybe you should do it the other way around to leave Fine. the gratitude messages Fine. coming through well, and I thought you were quiet screening out ones. you're screening out people that annoy them based on like we, technology like we we have found differences in region believe it or not of the U.S. like who sends more thank you than others there's that's absolutely true now we could go down that rabbit hole but I'll pull it back a little bit but I've I'd gone say down that rabbit hole before people yeah. are like it's a little distracting. Like, yeah. uh, you're thanking them so much. How do we get our work done? Exactly. So, um, yeah, a couple other things that we're working on. So particularly with, with message management, we're working on some AI that will actually be able to assign, uh, just read the text and assign it into different buckets and say, we know this is about a prescription renewal request, or we know this is about um, recent results or something like that, to cue things up for the clinicians. And then... Yeah, we are definitely, we have uh, voice activated Epic now where you can just say, hey, Epic, look up this value for me or start my note for me. So that's available. That's in the wild today on, on mobile devices and on desktops. Um, but yeah, the future really for us is the ambient listening where there's we, there's a microphone in the room that records everything that happens, the entire conversation, and also along with some physician gestures and some keywords, can actually order things and start the documentation just with the physician's voice so that they can still have that eye contact with the patient. And then taking all, into account everything that happened in the room, at the end of the visit, the at the feature will be able to basically write the entire progress note. Now it's going to need some edits, uh, as you can imagine. But that's the goal. We have prototypes of that um, that are working right now. Uh, but so within the next year or two, we, we expect to see that deployed. And so I think that's really exciting technology, the type of technology that can fade into the background. You can have your conversation with the patient, make a few gestures, you know, tell Epic to place a few orders for you. And at the end, it, it writes your note. So that's the Pollyann is like, we know we can get there um, in the future, but uh, vision for us, but we know it's real because the prototypes work when we've gone in to do some pilots with it, it has worked so far. The issue is complexity. Um, for a simple one problem visit, you know, no problem really in, in terms of doing that. But when the patient comes in with eight or 10 comorbidities and it gets then it's like a normal patient right? <laughs> touche or someone like me who's testing and just throws in random phrases to mess it up we always 100 percent do <laughs> matt why don't you share yeah i guess from my end the one thing i've been like most excited about and again i do a lot large amount of telehealth and virtual care is this uh developing, I guess, on my end, but then also teaching uh, this idea of digital empathy. I think for me, like, how does that fill your cup as a physician, as a clinician, um, connection with patients and connections with, with colleagues. So really kind of teaching how do you connect both over video, we're all on Zoom, um, and I've yet to meet any of you lovely people in person. But then how do you kind of, how does that translate over in, in, in a video environment? And actually even more so going back to the idea of the in-basket, in, in an in-basket environment. So kind of one, a lot of self-reflection, how does that look like on, on my end when I'm communicating with patients and colleagues and but then like kind of teaching teaching those lessons learned so that the digital empathy piece um is my small way of trying to uh, chip away so that the uh, moral injury physician burnout yeah that's important like it's it's hard to connect with people 
I'm better in online, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. And those, and those connections are what I hear a lot of the, are, are a lot of the reason why clinicians went into this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I love, I love that. Uh, I like both of those, um, initiatives. What, what we're working on primarily is, um, looking at the bigger picture and how do we engage all of the stakeholders? How do we engage patients, which is part of the reason why we wrote the book? How do we engage organizations and clinicians, regulators, legislators? How do we bring all those folks together and say, we know this was done with good intent, but it's had some unintended consequences. So how do we work together to mitigate some of the, some of the uglier parts of those unintended consequences so that we can all get to better. Um, and we're doing that through a grant that we have with HRSA that's developing a national, um, a national framework for burnout and moral injury that should be coming out in the next couple of months. Um, but really it's about having a lot of conversations with folks to say, how do we get to better? What would better look like to you? That's awesome. And you have a book releasing. We're excited about this. So we're all excited to all be invited to the, <laughs> to the framework for those conversations and, and also to read your book. Um, at the end of the day today, we will have a live round table at 4 p.m. for conversations with the Health Impact live virtual every month. They have those conversations of people who are making decision makers. And I think that's such a good and important point, like get the right people in the room. And, and also what I really liked about all the initiatives is that they're working with your particular expertise, like do what you can do and, and then move forward. I want to thank you all for talking with me today and ongoing conversations where I get to learn so much. I'd be happy to join. Uh, one last plug. If anyone wants to reach out to Epic, any physicians out there who want to hear about, uh, you know, how to be faster in Epic, uh, there's just a simple email address, tips at epic.com. You'll get someone from the physician well-being team and whatever your questions are, complaints, ideas, we want to hear them. Uh, and we want to, to Wendy's point and Matt's point, we want to engage in a dialogue because uh, that's how we'll come to solutions. And we Thanks plan for the to help promote that. Thank you. We're going to yeah, promote the heck out of that email, just so you know. <laughs> That's great.